Okay, uh, welcome back after the Halloween weekend. So, the first announcement, uh, or not announcement actually, the question is, there is a midterm scheduled next Friday on November 12th, and it's also the day when your assignment five is due. Are you guys okay with it? Or do you want them to be on two different days? Do you want the midterm two to be in the week after that, after assignment five is due? Or what's the preference? Sorry? On different days will be better. Weekend days? On different days. On different days, okay. So November twelfth? No, no, November 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th. How about November 15th for the midterm? Everyone okay with it? Okay. So I'll write it here. Midterm 2 on November 15th. I want to, I mean, I'm sure you all know that November 11 is a holiday. It doesn't affect us because our class is on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. November 11 is Thursday. So November 11 is a holiday. Uh, and the midterm two will be on November 15th. And it will be the similar situation. I'll upload it at 8 a.m. on Monday. And it will be due on Tuesday, 8 a.m. And uh, you can, it'll be just similar to midterm one. Yes. But Friday the 12th is the original date. Or Friday the 19th, because I think we all, most of the students in this class would have an in-class exam on Tuesday, 16th. Which? 6001 class. It's not most students then. Okay. <laughs> but a small subset of students will have uh, an in-class exam. Uh, and Wednesday? I could keep it on Wednesday. Uh, anyone has? problem with Wednesday being the exam day? No? Okay. November, is that November 17th? Okay, November 17th. Uh, so this will include everything until assignment 5. Uh, so the, the syllabus will be everything until assignment 5. Yes? So two questions. So not including assignment 5 though? Just including assignment 5. Okay. Okay. So uh, midterm 1 was for assignment 1, 2, 3, and midterm 2 would be assignment 3, 2, 5, or assignment 4, 2, 5, whatever you want to call it, yeah. The final assignment, yes, the final assignment will be due after Thanksgiving, which will include all the dynamic optimization methods for which we have not had any exam, but that should be okay, yes. Uh, very soon, probably by Wednesday or Thursday of this week. Yeah. Any other question? Is assignment five posted? Already? Sorry. Assignment five. It's posted already. Is it, is it posted yeah. The file or not oh, I have to unlock the file. Okay, I'll publish the files right after this class, so you should see it. Okay. Life is difficult. Uh, any other question? No. Okay. Okay. So let's go back to our discussion in the previous class. So we studied one theorem which was very useful for establishing convergence of optimization algorithms. And the proof of that theorem relies on what is known as Banach contraction mapping theorem. This is also, uh, so whatever I'm going to teach in today's class is actually your assignment problem. Uh, it, it's an assignment five problem. So you have to do whatever I'm doing on the board. You have to rewrite the same thing in your own words in the assignment five, problem number four or five, maybe. So, uh, so what is the contraction mapping theorem? So there are some definitions. So let's say X is a, Closed subset 
and t is a mapping from x to x is said to be a contraction map if t of x1 minus t of x2 norm is less than or equal to alpha, oh, I have to use beta, x1 minus x2. Alpha is a step size, so I'll use beta here. Here beta is supposed to be between 0 and 1. Okay, so what exactly is a contraction map? So I have a set, closed set. This is my closed set, X. And I have two points, X1 and X2. And then I map, uh, I, I apply the operator T or the map T onto this X1. So I get TX1 and I get Tx2. I have two points x1 and x2 and apply the mapping T onto these two points and I get two uh, points Tx1 and Tx2. The good thing is both these points are within the set capital X. Okay, because T maps a point in X to another point in X. Okay, it's a contraction map if the distance between Tx1 and Tx2 is smaller than a factor times the distance between X1 and X2. So what's the distance between X1 and X2? That's this distance. What's the distance between Tx1 and Tx2? That's this distance. And this distance is smaller than, less than or equal to beta times this particular distance. Then it's a contraction map. It has to be true for any two points. Yes? When we covered projection, there was like a similar inequality, and we said that projection was a non exactly. operation. Exactly. So is this the same? It's the same thing. The reason why projection is non expansive is because their beta is equal to 1. So is projection a no, because beta is equal to 1. For contraction map, beta has to be less than 1. Okay? So projection was non-expansive because beta was equal to 1 there. Uh, this is a contraction because beta is strictly less than 1. Okay? Any other question? Okay. So that's the first definition. The second definition so x bar is a fixed point fixed point of T if if and only if T x bar equal to x bar. Okay. All right, let me give you an example of T that pertains to the optimization subject that we are studying.
let me define t of x to be the gradient descent operator x minus alpha gradient of fx. My capital X is Rn. Does T maps a vector in Rn to Rn? Yes, right? So under some conditions on F, T would be a contraction map. We will talk about those conditions later on. So in this case, T maps a point in Rn to another point in Rn. What is the fixed point of T in this case? When is T of x bar equals to x bar? Yes. When the gradient is zero. When the gradient is zero. So if gradient of fx bar is equal to zero, this is first order necessary condition for optimality. Okay. So, in, so at the point which satisfies first order necessary condition for optimality, that point is a fixed point of this map T. Okay, which is why this whole theory is useful to us. Because it will allow us to conclude under what conditions is this mapping going to converge to a fixed point which is which is fixed point of T, which is where the first order necessary condition is, is satisfied. Okay. Now this is the contraction mapping theorem. I think this would be from 1920s, somewhere around 1920s, when this theorem was established. Uh, so consider the sequence, let x0 be in capital X, consider the sequence xk plus 1 equals to txk. Okay. The theorem suggests, the theorem establishes the following fact. Xk is a Cauchy sequence Xk converges to a point say x bar and third x bar is a fixed point of t. Those are the three implications of this uh, operator, this assumption, contraction mapping assumption. Oh, I must say that T is a contraction map here. So this is a contraction map. Okay, so I started from, I have a closed set capital X. I pick any point in the closed set. I pick it arbitrarily, okay? And I iteratively apply the contraction map T to the initial point. So, so I get X1 and X2 and X3 and so on. So just like the gradient descent, in, in gradient descent you do exactly the same thing. You start with some initial point and then you iteratively apply 
the gradient descent operator or the gradient descent map. Now, if T is a contraction, if T is a contraction map, then XK, the sequence generated through this process, iterative application of T, is a Cauchy sequence, which implies XK converges to a point, say X bar. So this implication was uh, maybe covered in lecture three or lecture four, somewhere in lecture three or four, where we talked about this Cauchy sequence converges. So I don't really have to talk much about 1 to 2 because 1 to 2 is a very well-known theorem in mathematics and it's beyond the scope of this class. So all I have to show is that xk is a Cauchy sequence. From math, I know that xk would converge to a point. Let me call that point x bar, which is also in x. And it turns out that x bar is a fixed point of t. So this point to which the sequence converges is actually a fixed point of T. In the context of gradient descent algorithm, that fixed point would satisfy the first order necessary condition for optimality. So, so it's really very uh, cool result. All it needs, all I need to show that my algorithm converges or the gradient descent algorithm converges is to establish that T is a contraction map. That's all I need to do. And once I establish that, then the implications follow directly from this contraction mapping theorem. OK. Let's go ahead and prove the theorem. OK. What is? Uh, what is the Cauchy sequence? So I need to show that xk plus m minus xk is less than or equal to epsilon for k sufficiently large. So k should be greater than sub capital K of epsilon. This is what I need to show in order for me to show that this is a Cauchy sequence. This is the definition of Cauchy sequence. For every epsilon greater than 0, xk plus m minus xk is less than or equal to epsilon for k sufficiently large and for all m in capital N. That's a Cauchy sequence. So let's try to do that. I have xk plus m minus xk I'm going to use triangle inequality to get this expression Now I need to bound each of these terms individually. So let's look at this term. Let's look at this particular term, xk plus 1 minus xk norm. What is this equal to? So this is equal to txk minus txk minus 1, which is less than or equal to beta xk minus xk minus 
Okay. So I have uh, xk plus 1 minus xk is smaller than beta, which is a value which has a value strictly less than 1 times xk minus xk minus 1. And I can continue this process over and over again. And I will get beta raised to k x1 minus x0. Right? I'm going to apply the same operation here, and then same operation here, and the same operation here. And I'm going to get beta raised to k x1 minus x0. What happens when k goes to infinity? What happens to this term? It goes to 0, right? Because beta is less than 1. So I know from the assumption of the contraction map that each of these terms individually is going to go to 0 as k goes to infinity, right? However, if I want to bound this term, if I want to show that this term is less than epsilon, then I have to show that the sum is also going to 0, not just individual terms, OK? So let's try to see if we can establish that fact or not. Any questions on this this one? Uh, yes. The first line, how, how is that equal to the t of k and k? So that's the definition, right? xk plus 1 is t of xk. Um, and xk is t of xk minus 1. OK? All right. So this is less than equal to beta raised to k plus m minus 1, x1 minus x0, beta raised to k, x1 minus x0. So I see that x1 minus x0 is a common term across all these different terms. So I have beta raised to k, beta raised to m minus 1. x1 minus x0. Oh, actually, this is not less than equal to, this is equal to. OK. So what do I have here? So I know that each of these terms are going to 0 individually as k goes to infinity. Now I'm going to combine some of the terms together for ease of analysis. So I have this term that goes to 0 as k goes to infinity. This term, which is going to remain constant throughout the k. And then I have this geometric series which, which, if I let m go to infinity, this is also an infinite sum, OK? So it can be, it's an infinite sum. But do, what do I know about this particular series? What is it less than equal to? OK, let, let me ask a separate question. What is this equal to? This is a geometric series. and. I'm sure you have seen this before. What is this sum equal to? Yes. Um, 1 over 1 minus theta. Right. So that's, uh, yeah, so that is less than equal to. So that was answer to the first question. But for this, it is 1 minus beta raised to m over 1 minus beta. which is, of course, less than equal to 1 over 1 minus beta. So what I have is this is less than equal to beta raised to k over 1 minus beta times 
x1 minus x0. Okay, so this is a straightforward calculation. Now what is 1 over 1 minus beta? A constant. x1 minus x0, a constant. Beta raised to k goes to 0 as k goes to infinity, which is what we wanted, right? So let's try to figure out a value of k epsilon such that if k is greater than k epsilon, then uh, xk plus m minus xk is going to be less than or equal to epsilon. So I can actually compute k of epsilon as I want this to be less than or equal to epsilon. So I will have log of epsilon over log of beta. No, log of epsilon times 1 minus beta over x1 minus x0 over log of beta plus 1. So if I pick any k greater than this number, then my xk plus m minus xk is going to be less than or equal to epsilon for all m in capital N. So I have established that xk is a Cauchy sequence in this case. So if I pick xk plus m minus xk, and I let k go to infinity, the right side goes to zero. From lecture three or four, I know that xk converges to a point x bar in capital X. Now the only thing that is left is to show that this x bar is a fixed point of t, okay? So let's Let's do that. Any questions on this one before I erase? OK. All right. So xk plus 1 equals to txk. Let me take, I know that this xk converges to x bar. So let me take limit k goes to infinity. This is equal to x bar. Limit k goes to infinity t of xk. What does this converge to as k goes to infinity? Converges to t of x bar. This implies t of x bar equals to x bar. Okay. Which means that x bar is a fixed point of capital T, the contraction map capital T. So fairly straightforward uh, proof of this contraction mapping theorem, but it has far reaching consequences in the field of mathematics, including optimization. Okay, any questions so far?
So, you know, you will come across, maybe uh, in your career, you will come across maybe a million algorithms. No, maybe a million is too high. 10,000 algorithms. And among those 10,000 algorithms, I can bet that 1,000 algorithms, the proof of convergence follows from this theorem. Okay? So it's a, it's a hammer that is used time and again to establish convergence of algorithms. And those algorithms could be from any field. It could be from optimization. It could be from partial differential equations. It could be from differential equations. It could be from uh, manifolds. Uh, it could be from optimization. And no matter you come up with any uh, field of mathematics, and you come up with an algorithm, and you want to prove that that algorithm converges to a point that is a, a desirable point, then you have to use contraction mapping theorem to establish that. To give you an example, you might have studied ODE solvers, ordinary differential equation solvers, as part of your undergrad curriculum, perhaps. So, so I actually did my undergrad in aerospace, so we had to do both partial differential equation solvers and ordinary differential equation solvers. And in all of those solvers, you want to know, like you're running this simulation on supercomputer, which is trying to figure out what the flow field looks like around a, 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 a rocket, right? And you want to know whether that flow field is accurate or not. Does it represent the reality? It turns out, in those situations, the flow field is the fixed point of a contraction operator. And you want to pick your step size. So there is a step size. Remember, we have a step size in optimization. You have a step size also in ODE solvers. And you have a step size also in uh, partial differential equation solvers. So you have to pick your step size so that your solver becomes a contraction map and then its convergence to a desirable point is automatic from this theorem. So this theorem is invoked time and again. I have never, never seen a field of mathematics where this theorem was not invoked for proving convergence of algorithms. Okay, so I, I really love this, love this theorem. And a lot of my recent research uh, is a generalization of this theorem to more complicated settings. Now let's see how this helps us in proving the convergence of the Lagrangian method that we had discussed in the previous class. So in the previous class, we had the following result. So I had a function h. that maps Rn to Rn. And I have totally forgotten what the rest of the condition was. Can someone remind me uh, what was the condition? Y star is a fixed point of H. The spectral radius. is less than one. I think this was the result. Then there exists a neighborhood Y of Y star such that for any Y not in Y, T of yk converges to Okay.
Okay, so this was the result. How do you think we should go about solving, proving that result, proving that theorem? This was the theorem that we wanted to prove in the previous class. And now we know the contraction mapping theorem. What do we need to show? H is a contraction map over Y, okay? All I have to show is that H is a contraction map on the set Y, capital Y. So let's do that. Okay. So the proof is need to show H is a contraction map on Y. Okay. Let me let me show you a picture. And let me tell you a little bit of uh, more, more uh, intricate points that are needed to establish this result. So the contraction map required a few ingredients. What did it require? We need to have a norm on the space, right? right? So contraction map requires a norm. We need to have a contraction coefficient beta we need to have the description of the neighborhood Y, okay? So all of those things are needed before I can go ahead and prove that H is a contraction map. So let's try to construct each of these things uh, in some way. So let me pick epsilon to be one minus rho gradient of h of y star. And I know that this is strictly greater than zero. Okay, one minus rho gradient of h at y star. So rho is the spectral radius. Uh, this I know is strictly less than one. So epsilon must be a positive number. So step one, okay. So I know that H of Y1 minus H of Y2 is equal to, anyone knows what this is equal to? gradient h of y tilde transpose. Well, should there be a transpose? Maybe not. Y1 minus y2. Where y tilde lies along the line segment y1 to y2. So I have this y star. I pick a point y1. I pick a point Y2. Somewhere along this line segment, I have Y tilde. And by mean value theorem, by mean value theorem, I can establish this statement. Okay. So now step two.
for every, so for epsilon over three, epsilon over three is strictly positive. So there exists a neighborhood capital Y of Y star such that the spectral radius of is less than one minus epsilon over three for all y. Why should this be the case? What do we know about eigenvalues of a matrix as the entries in the matrix changes? Do you think they are continuous? Okay, so spectral radius is a function of eigenvalues of this matrix, gradient of H. Now gradient of H changes, the entries of the gradient of H changes as you change Y. So I'm at Y star and I'm kind of moving I could pick any point in the neighborhood of Y star. And the gradient of H at Y is going to be a different matrix. But remember that H is a continuous function. The derivative is a continuous function. So as you change the value of Y, the gradient of H, the entries in the matrix gradient of H is changing continuously. And what do we know about the eigenvalues of a matrix as a function of the entries in the matrix. Well, if you change the, perturb the entries of a matrix a little bit, the eigenvalues are also going to change only a little bit. It's not going to change significantly. So eigenvalues are actually continuous function of the entries of the matrix. So I know that the eigenvalues are going to change continuously as a function of Y. So the spectral radius, which is the maximum of absolute value of eigenvalues, that's also going to change continuously with Y. And therefore, in a neighborhood of Y star, I can come up with a neighborhood Y bar, or, or sorry, of capital Y, such that the row, the spectral radius of H of Y is less than one minus epsilon over three, okay? So that's one step. Uh, I don't expect you to know, I'm just writing it on the board, but these are all important uh, steps of this particular result, which, uh, so I, I'm not expecting you to come up with these statements on your own because it requires some deeper insight into linear algebra, which we haven't covered in this class, but it's good to know these steps because you might need it in the future. Okay, now here is another result from linear algebra. So, if rho of A is less than one, then there exists a norm on Rn such that Ax1 minus Ax2. So A is a matrix rho of A is less than one, then there exists a norm such that norm of AX1 minus AX2 is less than or equal to rho A plus epsilon over three, norm of X1 minus X2. Okay, this is also something that comes from linear algebra, a very important result.
ओके सो नाउ आई कैन ब्रिंग ऑल द थ्री स्टेप्स टुगेदर H of y1 minus H of y2 norm is less than equal to norm of gradient of H y tilde y1 minus y2, which is less than equal to the spectral radius of gradient of H y tilde plus epsilon over 3, no, right, norm of y1 minus y2, that comes from step 3, One minus oh, uh, should I have two epsilon over three here? I should have two epsilon over three. So then I'll have one minus epsilon over three times y one minus y two. So please make a change. There is a two epsilon here, one minus two epsilon over three in step two. Please make this change. Two epsilon over three here. So now everything works out. So I've identified a neighborhood of Y star. I've identified a closed set Y where this holds true. I have identified a norm where this holds true, and then I have used step one, step three, and then step two to conclude that there is a beta with respect to which there, there is a beta and a norm so that H is a contraction operator over this capital Y. Yes, it's not inside, it's, it's rho of gradient of H plus epsilon over 3. Okay. Okay. So this is the application of contraction mapping theorem to optimization, okay? And how do we apply it? Well, this is the result. And I come up with any algorithm where y star equals to h of y star, as long as I can show that the spectral radius of H, the matrix gradient of h evaluated at y star is less than one, then iterative application of H will lead to convergence to Y star, which is the fixed point of the map H. Proof follows from contraction mapping theorem. Okay. Now let's go back to the Lagrangian method and try to argue how do I construct the H which satisfies this condition. Okay. Any question on this before I move on to the application? No, okay. Oh. 
Okay. So suppose in that example, gradient of h of y star was i minus alpha b, and we knew that real part of lambda i of b was strictly positive. These were the two things I knew from the analysis of Lagrangian method. So let's see if I can come up with an alpha, a step size alpha, so that the spectral radius of gradient of h is less than 1. What are the eigenvalues of i minus alpha b? One minus alpha lambda one, one minus alpha lambda n. Right? And now let's say each lambda i is a i plus j b i. j is a complex number. Minus one, and I know that a i is greater than zero. So think about what happens when you pick alpha sufficiently small. So let's pick an alpha which is very, very small. What will you observe? So if I pick alpha small, I have 1 minus alpha ai minus alpha j bi. That's my eigenvalue, ith eigenvalue. So the norm, sorry, the absolute value of this is going to be 1 minus alpha ai square plus alpha square b i square. Right, that's the absolute value of this eigenvalue. And I want this to be less than one, okay? So that the spectral radius will be less than one. So if I pick alpha small, this is equal to one plus alpha square a square plus alpha a i square. Can this be less than one? What do you think? Can I pick a alpha greater than zero so that this term is strictly less than one? Let's, uh, okay, I'll, 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 uh, I'll stop here and in the next class I'll start, I'll pick it up from here and I'll show you that I can come up with an alpha such that this whole term is less than one. This would imply that the spectral radius of h at y star is less than 1, which would imply that h of yk converges to y star, which is the optimal solution for the Lagrangian method. So, so it satisfies the first order necessary condition in the context of Lagrangian method. So that's all I have for today, and I'll see you guys on Wednesday.